All right, our final uh, class session. And uh, we've covered a lot of ground. And uh, we still have a, a little bit left to do here. What I want to do is I want to take a look at a, a passage of Scripture in Colossians 3, uh, verse 10. And uh, it reads, Having put on the new man, being renewed into full knowledge according to the image of the one creating him, where Greek and Jew, circumcision and uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free man, have no place, but Christ is all and is in all. And I want to start with that one. I like the music. <laughs> I, want to, I want to start with that, that passage because it, it, it epitomizes the very essence of the gospel and the way the church uh, was to, to proceed. That the gospel was, its intent was to go beyond barriers, to go beyond uh, friend and foe. And if you look at that passage, it just does that. It, it says what? It says that where Greek and Jew... Circumcision and uncircumcision. Barbarian, Scythian, slave, free man have no place. That the gospel then becomes one of, should I say, the chisels that knock down those walls. And... And it doesn't appear by the time we get into 350, it doesn't appear that that has taken place. If you equate the Roman Empire with Christianity, which you might as well by 350, you might as well equate the Roman with Christianity because there's already laws in effect by 350 that would 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 designate the fact that if there is somebody who is not a believer they are not in law with Rome <clears throat> it it is not so that that was a just move on the part of Rome. Not at all. That there was no precedence for an edict of that, of that nature. That, that even Rome in its in the height of the Caesars, even Rome in the height of the empirical force had a an inclusion factor, uh, one that would that would that used utilized the religions of the area of the regions as money makers. Hey, as it was good economy. Christianity changed the economy so drastically that it really weakened Rome's ability to to man a standing army. It was easy for the emperors to go to the, the next in command or the next in line 
in regard to property ownership, in regard to lordship, and extract great sums for their protection. And then it was easy for those to go in line to the next layer of noble ship and extract great sums for their protection. And on down the line, until the tax system was very corrupt. <clears throat> the term of putting on the new man uh, literally means to adorn, to dress, to clothe, to put something on, specifically robes. And as you read elsewhere, those robes are the righteous robes of Christ. Those that we do not, we do not, we are not righteous. That we adorn ourselves with Christ's righteousness. That righteousness of Christ is that which cuts through those barriers. Interesting enough also is that we being renewed into full knowledge according to the image of the one creating him. Literally what that means is this. Is that that is a material image. That's a likeness, an effigy, an exact image. What I would call anatomically correct. That it is, that it is, um, that it, its point, and its, its point is Christ, as it would be said in the Greek, en sarki, or in the flesh. So it dispels other doctrines also at the same time. It cuts through those other doctrines. It brings Christ as Savior of the flesh also. So that it can cut through physical boundaries. So that its purpose is to cut through those physical boundaries. Rome did not allow that to take place. I want to uh, I want to also uh, take a look at uh, 1 Corinthians uh, about uh, 9, about 18 <clears throat> and uh, I'm by the way these are my own translations uh, for though I am being free myself to all things out of all men I was enslaved in order that I might gain more men literally and I became to the Jews as a Jew in order that I might gain Jews to the ones under the law as under the law not being myself under the law in order that I might gain the ones under the law to the ones without the law, I became as without the law, not being myself without the law of God. And then he goes on, he says, I have become all things. I do all things in order that I may become a joint partaker in the gospel. You know, I, I like to I like I like a reference uh, to reference Paul as being to the Scythian I became a Scythian, to the Greeks I became a Greek, to the Romans I became a Roman, to the Jews I became a Jew. That those boundaries were not there for Paul. That that in so preaching the gospel 
he would go into a setting of unchurched and he would be in their society, in their culture. That he, so to speak, became a native of that culture. That he was a Roman to the Romans. That he was a Jew to the Jews. That he was a Scythian to the Scythians. I'm not sure that he got up to Scythia. But if you notice, one of the things that, that Paul mentions is that he is comparing you know, Greek to Jew. In other words, enemy to enemy, uncircumcised to circumcised. In other words, the unclean to the clean. And he does that for that very reason. That is the nature of the gospel. That is what the church was to put in into history. That was the way the gospel was to go. That understanding has, has revolutionized our, our understanding of missions today. That, that passage has created a, 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 a big change in missionary em emphasis. And rightly so. Now I'm going to ask a question to David here. In China, you become one of the Chinese, in a sense, don't you? Now you're, you're probably campus crusade for Christ. You're probably become a Chinese student. And that was an affirmative. <laughs> Just for the, for the record. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and, and so, you know, that is the proper position to take with the gospel. And even, even though in... I'm not sure if you're allowed now yet to take the gospel in, you're, you, you do it in a different way. You do it in a, in a way that is within something beneficial to their culture. That, 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 that what missions are about is to go in to that culture. Now that did not happen in Rome. The barbarians who were coming in were very much vehemently opposed to Christianity because it had become equated with the Roman Empire. So not only were the barbarians, the hordes that, that, uh, that, that the onslaught of the Germanics, the onslaught of the Huns, the onslaught of the Scythians, the onslaught of the, of, um, the Ivani, the onslaught of the Vandals, the Goths, the Visigoths, and it was just a never-ending pounding that, that Rome was taking. And by and large, they were also focused on Christianity. They would not leave churches alone because they were sacred. But the Romans did whatever they could to subdue those other cultures and to subdue them in a manner which made them less than the Romans. And that was, that was very much a part of the church too. And I want, I want you to understand that. That, that this understanding of, of mi piet, pious missionaries just was not there until later. Until, until actually toward 400 when, when St. Patrick goes into the, into the mission service in Ireland. That, that the church did not treat those on their borders well because they were they were um, threats to the security of Rome 
And because they were a threat to the security of Rome, they were a threat to Christianity. So Paul saying, I became, and I, and I love this, the use of anomos in the Greek, uh, I became to those who are lawless, literally, not with, just without the law, lawless, I became lawless. An interesting, very interesting use of terms. Why Paul? Why Paul the Apostle said to those who were without the law, I became like one without the law or lawless. That's something that you have to answer. It's something that you have to ponder for yourself. That's why I see time again, time after time, Paul not going in and beating up a pagan culture. I don't see that happening. <clears throat> you know, he not going in under a condition of piety and, and trying to conform everybody to the image of Paul. We saw that in, in uh, English uh, evangelism in the 18th and 19th centuries. We saw, we saw the, the English missionaries going in, and they were Anglican missionaries, going into to cultures and who cares if it's 110 degrees with 80% humidity, they shall be clothed. Because the English are clothed. But see, the gospel transcends that. The gospel was, its requirement was to transcend that. And, and, and Paul makes a great case for, for uh, modern missions. <laughs> Paul makes a great case for, for missionary endeavor here. And, and that is that you go in into their culture as one from their culture and the gospel goes with you. And therefore, you might win some. Otherwise, you win none. Go backwards. You go backwards, exactly. You go backwards. Right. And you end up with on your borders the Germanics. You end up with on your borders the Huns. You end up with on your borders somebody wanting to tear your system down. Now, remember in the Middle Ages, evangelism in the Middle Ages was by the sword. And the Crusades were just for that. That they wanted the Christians to have the Holy Land. And so evangelism was by the sword. In fact, in fact, Edward I had that sense of evangelism. By the way, Edward I, uh, the Longshanks, he isn't portrayed very well in Braveheart. <laughs> and, and rightly so. But he wanted to go to the Crusades too. His, his, his dream, his aspiration was to, to conduct a crusade. Well, there was a notion in all of Europe at this time that one could, by pain, by, by administration of pain, actually cleanse somebody's soul. That that had become part of Rome. That by Roman edict of the popes, that was 
a way of evangelism. So could you could have an inquisition and you could convert Jews by inquisition by great duress now it was a, yes is that also kind of their justification for their approach to exorcism is that their justification of their approach toward exorcism you know I, I don't know I don't know. I'm, I'm not sure that I can answer that. And I don't, I have never read anything combining the two. Um, I, I know that, <clears throat> that part of that was burning at the stake. And and I believe that that came about in that form of exorcism. So, whether whether that was linked, whether the one was before the other, um, it was it was readily used. Uh, burning at the stake was readily used in Europe uh, in the in the 15th, 14th, 15th centuries. Prior to that, it was torture. And torture was used as a cleansing process of the soul. How did this begin? How did it all begin? Well, I have my, I have my notions. I have my... Um, I have my suspicions. And it, and it, and it comes about in, by edict from Rome. And it's about the time of actually Damasus, who was who was uh, just prior to uh, Bishop of Rome, prior to Jerome. But Jerome was around at the time, <clears throat> and there's a couple of things that the Damasus did. One, he utilized uh, Gratian. To uh, massacre the Priscillianists, some ten thousand uh, people from Spain. Now, some sources will tell you that uh, that that uh, massacre uh, happened much later, like about forty years. But but it F.F. Um, Bruce puts it around three sixty eight somewhere around there which would be uh, which would be Damascus' second year in, in office what else did Damascus do he hires in 366 when he took office he hires a gang of thugs and massacres the Yersinians who was a at the time there were three bishops of Rome and the Yersinians were supporters of one of the other bishops. And Damasus hires an army, essentially, to kill 137 uh, supporters of his uh, opposition. Now, that didn't really set too well. By the way, the bishop's name was Felix. That didn't uh, set too well uh, amongst other churches. But, it, but then after a while, uh, Damascus was uh, kind of exhausted and, and, and gained popularity again. What that did, it was by edict that he raised this army. And it was by, it was by, um, he excommunicated communicated Felix, and Felix excommunicated Damasus. So it was kind of a mutual throwing of the, <laughs> of the edicts around. <clears throat> 
Damascus had a, this notion of that um, he he started to take Tertullian's words to another plane, so to speak. If if the Bishop of Rome, if the Pope could raise an army, then the Pope was truly sitting on the throne of the Emperor. No, at the time Gratian was Emperor. But what happened was Gratian, about the same time, said, I cannot be Pontificus Maximus. I can't possibly be Pontificus Maximus. So, Gratian, actually it was before that, but, but Gratian was the one who made that statement. And, and the Bishop of Rome comes in and says, but I can. And I can hold this together as one unit. And immediately in 370, Damascus makes an edict and he states that the test of creed and council orthodoxy is, is, must be endorsed by the Pope. In other words, to test the orthodoxy of what is coming out of council, what is coming out of creed that, that normally would be administrated by council. And this is ecclesiastical council. Remember, 600 bishops get together, 500 bishops get together and, and determine orthodoxy. That if it is not endorsed by the Pope, then it is not orthodox. And therefore, the council is overridden. Now, that sets up, uh, that sets up a different system and it further divides east from west, by the way. If, if, if one thought that the east and the west were divided before, it is thoroughly divided now. All of these edicts that these popes are implementing are building on one another. And little by little, there seems to be a direction being taken. Frankly, it is a, a wonder that the church even survived. But there was some, there was some uh, outskirt evangelism going on that that I believe really saved the church. And that outskirt evangelism was happening in, in the aisles. And it was about this time that, uh, that Patrick uh, and others were commissioned. Now, uh, Alban, by the way, uh, who, uh, who had earlier gone to, to uh, uh, what would be called Northumberland or what would be called uh, like the Wales, or excuse me, not Wales, uh, like um, uh, York, um, Somerset, in those areas up on northern British side. Uh, he was there in 325. So Alban being the first actually to, to take the gospel into uh, an one of the kingdoms which was the Dalriadia kingdom of Scotland. Patrick becomes bishop of Ireland in 435. Prior to that, Palladius in 431 to 432 is appointed by Rome as bishop of, of Ireland. And he sets up several churches in that, in that one year. It was actually one year before he died. He sets up several churches. He dies 
quickly in his, in his uh, ministry and he's replaced by Patrick who had already seen a vision for Ireland. And uh, Patrick uh, ends up uh, becoming the Bishop of Ireland. He, he uh, evangelizes uh, the Lordship or one of the kings of Ireland which was at the time Hugh O'Neill in Ulster and by the way that's the other connection to Scotland again because it was the Ulster Irish who were also the the Scotty uh, Columba evangelizes the Picts in 450 way up north almost up into the Hebrides so the, the barbarians in way in the north of the Isles and the east of the Isles or excuse me the west of the Isles are becoming evangelized but the, one of the problems is one of their members was Pelagius <laughs> And he had some impact uh, in the Isles. He had a great impact in the Isles, of which Rome did not really subdue. Now, Palladius was actually sent to Ireland to curb the, the Pelagians in Ireland. So there was a church, by the way. There were churches prior to these men. Now, where did they come from? Well, there's uh, there's some there are some uh, early early traditions that uh, one Claudia and Pudens, P U D E N S, uh, in the first century. One, uh, in fact, they're mentioned in Second Timothy four twenty one in in Paul's epistle. Uh, that they act, they went up there uh, commissioned by Paul to uh, to take the gospel up into uh, Great Britain and even into Ireland, and that they accomplished that. And then, of course, there was some uh, there was some tradition that, that even Peter got to uh, to the Isles anyway into what was controlled by Rome. So. Evangelism happened early here, but it, it 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 just was just kind of rolling along, and it was out of sight, out of mind from Rome until Pelagius comes into the scene. And when Pelagius comes into the scene, then uh, Pelagius makes a, a quite an impact on on the church because he is kind of kicking against the goad of orthodoxy. Much of that out of sight, out of mind process or, or, or attitude from Rome makes Great Britain a very, a, a very interesting field. That Great Britain actually becomes the bed seed for later, um, later, should I say, post-Reformation uh, movements in regard to Arminianism, uh, what, what I would call Pelagianism in, in essentially in the area of the understanding of, of original sin. And we've inherited that. Now there were there were some very very strong reform movements in uh, Scotland 
for instance. But remember, remember at that later time, the English crown and the Anglican system didn't care too much for the Presbyterians of Scotland. And rightly so. I, they, they, were, they were austere and nasty. And that's probably about the best words that I can say for them. <laughs> and being, a, being of the Presbyterian stock, I, you know, what can I say? <laughs> we were austere and nasty. <laughs> so, but nonetheless, I believe that that that, that uh, fed that seedbed of Pelagianism and kept that going, even though the church by and large had, had, uh, had declared that Pelagianism was a heresy. I want to also make mention that under Jerome, under his council, that Jerome had uh, had counseled the Bishop of Rome to to restore Nestorius to communion and to actually lighten up on Pelagius and to not um, extinguish Pelagius the way the Priscillians were extinguished. Now remember the Priscillianists were declared to be uh, monarchianists and that was, uh, that was the, the verdict or the, the indictment against them that that caused uh, their destruction. By the way, uh, as a result of that, um, there were several notable people. Uh, one was uh, Ambrosius of Milan, who had condemned uh, who had condemned the Damascus's uh, Damascus's uh, act there. And also, uh, Benedict had also condemned. So that was not well received amongst the other bishops of Christendom. I'm going to start calling Christianity Christendom now instead of Catholicism because Catholicism is well defined from the West. And Catholicism doesn't match that of the East. So even though the, Catholic, the true Catholic Church is the entirety of it, um, it's declared itself Orthodox and the East uh, out of Orthodoxy. <clears throat> During this time, during Jerome's time, during during Damascus's time, uh, all the way to Gregory's time, what you have is you have a constant onslaught. Alaric of the Vandals, Attila, uh, Genesaric uh, of the Vandals, the Lombards, um, the Lombards are, are, have control of northern Italy and, uh, and fighting with the papal, uh, with the papacy. It's continual slot. By the time of 450, there's not much left of the Western Roman Empire even though they put the, the date more like about 600 or 580, there is not much left. There is, there is hardly 
a serviceable army. Feudalism has begun to uh, blossom. That feudalistic lords control the regions and they, where Rome can put together enough money to buy those feudalistic lords for protection, there is none. There is no protection for Rome. That's why you have continual sack after sack after sack. It was that Rome is an easy killing. Now, also during this time, the Eastern Empire, to the Eastern Empire, that is disconcerting. And so, several of the emperors from the East come in and help. One of them was Theodosius, who chases after, after Attila the Hun, comes all the way across their area, and, and destroys 70 cities, chases Attila the Hun clear into France. But not before Attila the Hun backtracks into Rome and, and uh, surrounds Rome, the emperor of Rome at the time says he huddled in the city. <laughs> and Leo, Pope Leo, goes out and cuts a bargain. And he cuts a bargain with... Uh, I, I want to read a, a little article uh, out of... And by the way, this is going to, uh, this is going to be very... Uh, this is out of the uh, Catholic Encyclopedia, so you'll know the source. Uh, in the meantime, serious events of another kind were happening in the West. Attila, the scourge of God, after overrunning Greece and Germany with his Huns, had penetrated France, where he had been defeated at Cologne by the imperial general Aetius. Now, uh, by the way, um, I am not, I am thinking here that uh, actually Attila did not, was not defeated by a Western general. <clears throat> Falling back, he gathered fresh forces and then entered Italy from the northeast, burning Aquilia and leaving destruction in his wake. After sacking Milan and Pavia, he set out to attack the capital. The wretched emperor Valentinian, see, here's the, here's the putting forth the bishop now as the defender of, of the Roman Empire. The wretched emperor Valentinian III shut himself up within the walls of remote Ravenna. Panic seized the people of Rome in the emergency. Leo, upheld by a sense of his sacred office, set out to meet Attila, accompanied by Avenius, the council, Tregetius, the governor of the city, and a band of priests near the rivers of Po and Mincio, they met. They came face to face with the enemy. The Pope reasoned with Attila and induced him to turn back. I'm sorry, but what he did was he brought a lot of gold out and he gave him gold. And he also, at this same time, he said, go after the east. Well, Theodosius had come out to protect the west. But the west didn't want to be protected by the east because then the eastern emperor would rule the west. But what takes place is quite incredible. Theodosius pursues Attila into France. And one of the largest battles in the history of Europe, in fact, the largest battle in the history of Europe takes place, of which 106,000 men die in one day. 
and Attila loses. So you can kind of, you can get a, an indication about two things here. That one, that from Rome you're going to see a rewritten history. And that literally the West is crumbled. It's gone. The West is no more. The West no longer exists. The churches are on their own. Now, at this point, this is a, about 450, 451, four, between 451, 460. Now what, uh, what seems to be happening is that there's a backdrop of evangelism taking place from Great Britain or from the Isles. And it's coming back into the continent that Attila had destroyed most of the church in France. That most, that many of the cities and many of the churches in, in even the east, in the, da in the Balkan area, were destroyed. That most of Gaul, the churches in Gaul were destroyed. That the Pope was really alone. And they would have been, Rome would have been destroyed excepting the big bribe. Under the backdrop, Rome is between the barbarians and a church that it ignored. And evangelism starts to move into the continent again from the Isles. And as a result of that, that many of those who were pursuing the destruction of the Roman Empire are now Christians. And there's even, there is even a sense that Attila himself may have even been evangelized and come to Christianity. <clears throat> that was not done by Leo. And I don't think that the Roman church can make that claim. But by mid 400s, there were, there were patrician monasteries in what is now Normandy that the Irish had landed and they brought Celtic, the Celtic church into Europe and the Celtic monastic movement in the Europe. And it spreads like wildfire. And a lot of that has to do not necessarily with the doctrine of Patrick, because I think that's, there's some suspect there. Because I believe that Patrick was, by and large, in a sense, Pelagius. But what it has to do is by methodology. That Patrick was, and his followers were very well versed to, to the mission statements of Paul. And that, that they were able to go into those tribes and to become part of those tribes. And to make a good social good or should I say bring about social good in 
amongst the barbarians. The very ones that wanted to destroy Rome and, and Christianity with it. But they saw something different from, from the West. And that was a, a different form of gospel that came as it should. And, and mind you, mind you, Patrick wasn't saying something other than grace. He would just had a tendency to be Pelagic. And it supported the Celt tradition very well. One of the things that the Celts had, um, had in their society for, uh, for a thousand years was the understanding of freedom and, and, uh, and autonomy. They didn't want to be ruled. They didn't want to be uh, under servitude. That's why they held out so long against the onslaught of Rome. Rome was not able to go beyond the lower what is now England. They were not able to go beyond the Hadrian Wall. And it was, it was because of this fierce view that the, here come the Romans to enslave us. And that's exactly what the Romans did. And the Celts wanted nothing to do with that. And so they held out. And it was also, uh, in a sense, kind of uh, understanding that the Romans saw that the cost would not... Um, there wasn't really anything up there to go for anyway. There was not gold, there was not silver, but there was tin. And the tin mines of uh, the tin mines and the copper mines of Ireland were some of the greatest in all of Europe. In fact, that became a trading uh, point. Uh, with several groups, uh, it, it tied the eastern, um, the eastern empire, the Byzantine Empire, to Ireland, and it also tied the Vikings, who were the sailors, who were the merchant marine, to that tra those trade routes. So it brought the first settlers of the Vikings into uh, England and into, uh, into the Isles. And they stayed and, and, and uh, pretty soon they are in a sense of in a sense uh, becoming part of the woodwork. <laughs> um, I I, had, I, I want to clear, clarify something that I had said. I said that Jerome was the one who advised Pope uh, Sixtus to restore Nestorius. It was not Jerome, it was Leo. And I, I, want, to, I want to clarify that. It was Leo who advised Pope Sixtus um, to restore Nestorius to communion in 433. And also, it was Leo who, who uh, had, had uh, turned aside uh, Pope Sixtus' uh, emphasis to squelch Pelagianism. But uh, I also... I also do understand that uh, Jerome was also a contemporary of Pelagius, uh, that, that Jerome actually studied under Pelagius, that uh, he had some impact there also.
the restoration of the church in Europe uh, becomes a major event. It actually was, in a sense, a reformation itself. It encouraged the monastic movement. It, it, there was a combination of, of monastic um, fervor at the time. One group of them was the Benedictine order that really had, was greatly impacted by the Celtic church. But there were, there were Celtic monastic movement happening in France. There was the Benedictine monastic movement happening in Germany and in, in Netherlands, or what is now Netherlands. That was encouraged greatly by Gregory, by the way, between 590 and 604. All this time, Rome and the Bishop of Rome is, is building on edict and building on decretal. And, and I, under Gregory, more things happen toward the papacy than, than any other historical period. The papacy gathers great momentum and great strength. And yet Western Europe becomes completely um, completely under the control of the papacy, even though it, by edict it has not taken place. It doesn't happen until Pope Zachary in 751. Pope Zachary anoints Pepin king. And all public law in the West and all kings after that period of time by edict of the Pope must be approved by the Pope so that all kings answer directly to, to the Pope. By the way, Pepin's son was Charlemagne. And of course, Charlemagne becomes the first Holy Roman Emperor, and the emphasis is toward ranks now. In fact, in fact, Gregory sets up an alliance. Excuse me, not Gregory. I'm sorry, not Gregory. Uh, the, the, the papacy in 700 sets up an alliance with the Franks. And the Franks are becoming very powerful indeed. The, this, through the Frankish kingdoms is the first notion of nationalism in Europe. And nationalism becomes the element of surprise for the Reformation. In fact, it, it, uh, it allows the Reformation to, to exist. So the king goes, so the church goes. It had not been that way prior. As the Pope goes, so the church goes. Through European nationalism, through Western European nationalism by Charlemagne, even though Charlemagne was very much in line with Rome and in, in line with the Pope, the stage is set here, Reformation, because without that nationalistic system, 
the Reformation would not be able to continue. It would not survive. It would die out. 